right. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I guess first I would like to say if you guys can please mute your mics, uh, either on your phone or on the WebEx link down at the bottom, you can mute your mics if you connect it to audio. That will help everybody hear a whole lot better and just help this thing go a whole lot smoothly. But I guess first, um, so N Norfolk District is a, definitely a great place to work. Um, so uh, when I... The first probably thing that everybody's thinking about right now is coronavirus, what's going on, what is USACE doing, what is federal government doing. And here, uh, what I'm going to tell you is first, you know, we're caring about people. We're making sure that people are being taken care of, creating social distancing, uh, allowing people to maximize telework to, you know, try to mitigate any effects of coronavirus. So that's by far the first priority that we have. But on top of that, we also have to get and accomplish mission essential tasks and mission essential execution. And we really thought that this was part of our mission essential execution, so we're still going to continue to do it. Um, and then probably third priority of that is the whole of government response on how, as an organization and how a country, we're going to try to, uh, you know, um, solve this complex problem that is the coronavirus. And we're definitely going to do our part. And the thing that I love about the Corps of Engineers, and it's, you know, playing out in the news media a little bit, is the New York mayor asked the York Army Corps of Engineers to solve, you know, medical facilities in New York. I really that they solve the problem, they call on the Corps of Engineers to solve it. And that's why I think the Corps of Engineers is such a great place to work. Um, so I will kick off the agenda a little bit. Um, so we have kind of the senior leaders of the Norfolk District briefing you guys on, you know, um, how we see uh, AE um, Tax, or eight, uh, plan B vehicles and contracts that we have coming up. Um, we also, what we did is kind of pulled all of the contractors and people that signed up and asked what you want to talk about. And some of the conversations, you see the uh, overview, kind of what are task order procedures, um, you know, what selection criteria, all those are questions that we got asked that we are now going to provide some information. We'd rather do that in person and kind of talking together, but, um, you know, we'll make it work virtual. All right, ground rules. So first, please, please, please mute your microphones. We are getting a little bit of feedback. Um, uh, we are going to talk about slide numbers. So, for example, I'm on ground rules slide number three, so you'll hear that. So if you don't have the WebEx going, but you have the slides, you can follow along. Um, then I'll, I'll say... We're definitely interested in your feedback. We have something wrong or you have a question or a suggestion, uh, you have really two ways to do it. First is uh, either through WebEx, so there's a little chat box there that you can pull up and ask the question. We have people recording it and we'll get to the end. Or you can email Sherry Coons. Um, so her email address is right there on the PowerPoint slide on uh, or through, through the email ways to really ask questions. At the end, we're going to consolidate them, bring them up, um, and then a reminder out there, it is being recorded um, for everyone that's out there. So I will turn it over to Mike Darrow, our uh, DPM. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, hoping to see many of you face-to-face -face, um, in the next day at the SAME conference. Uh, in addition, we weren't going to talk much about the program. Uh, I'm going to give a kind of a brief synopsis of what I was going to brief tomorrow, just to really set the stage, because much of what current and future program is Further discussion on that AE contract moving forward. 
Uh, so the slide you see in front of me, uh, first of all, the left one, I'm like, that's the last three members for small business. Absolutely fabulous. Yeah. Met all our metrics. We clearly aren't going to meet our metrics this year because we have, if you look in the program summary, our biggest program probably since BRAC. And a lot, large, lot of those are military programs, large dollars. Uh, are going to be unrestricted. Um, someone asked what our FY20 goals are. Right now, we don't have approved small business goals, but we submitted what we had for FY19, and that's what we're striving for right now. Um, if you look at the map, just gives a highlight of our geographic area where we are doing work. Uh, so, really spread across the Commonwealth uh, in all different programs. And I'm going to spend a little bit about, I'm going to talk in details of each of the programs to the next. Slide. So I'm going from slide four to slide five. Uh, so just a kind of a couple of highlights of the key programs. Uh, so first of all, I've talked to a lot of you over the last year about the uh, support for Radford and Holton Army Ammunition Plants, and we have half of the presentation today talking about those AE specific contracts, as well as getting an overview of what uh, PDJS is doing for modernization. Uh, but we are going to put in place a $249 million uh, contract for that. Uh, and it's actually going to include uh, the rest of the, the Gold Coast. So more to follow on, on that. Our CM services uh, contract will be next, looking for early FY21 uh, to, to cover down on construction. And our first big project that we're doing out there is an energetic waste incinerator for Radford and FY 2021. And we're working uh, final design for that. Uh, so it's a huge program. We're super excited about it, and I know uh, and really appreciate the trust of uh, PDJS and, and the Army for the corporate at large to help tackle this huge program. Um, DODIA, many of you know, we I mean, we have a large DODIA program on the design side. Uh, the number of designs are going down. Their program is for new schools is uh, kind of hit an apex, but we're doing a lot of SRM for them, and you'll see in some following slides we actually have some SRM contracts uh, along with the day-to-day -day PM type contracts as well. Uh, some of the new construction is not, uh, it's more, more a conversion of existing schools to 21st century schools, uh, but we have a lot of AE tools in place, and most of those are good for another couple of years. Arlington remains important for us. Uh, the key, key program or project coming up is the Southern Expansion. I've been working through the final design on that, but that's going to be I mean, the overall program amount for that project, project is $350 million. Uh, and we're working some other minor work, SATOCs and a roads MATOC uh, as we move forward. Generally, it's about $20, $25 million a year in Arlington, and we will follow up with a couple of industry days for Arlington uh, this summer, one for Southern Expansion exclusively and one for the rest of the program. I'm going to follow. Hope you're here and have out there on site, and hopefully we can be on site like that. Um, Civil Works. We continue to get about uh, $35 million a year to do OM work. Our work is driving the North Carver the James River. Uh, it sounds like someone's got a pop mic, so if you guys could uh, please mute your mics, it would help everyone. Yes, uh, Ms. Fenwick, I think, has, I mean, would ask to mute your mic. Um, we do have a couple of earthwork uh, projects coming up to support Craney Island, a significant site, uh, dike raising site talk. And we continue to upgrade the spillway, so if that, that type of work is oncoming. Uh, Tangier Jetty, we finally have the solicitation posted for uh, a rock jetty to support navigation there. Um, and on the study side, I mean, we're actually beginning some initial design for the Norfolk Coastal Storm Risk Management, which is a, a $1.4 billion overall project. And we've just only got a little bit of money to start some initial work on the first phase. Milcon, huge program, normally three to five projects max, 100, 150 million. Um, this year we got several F-22 ads uh, linked to Tyndall. 
so there's four projects, and you can see the total PA of 186 million. Uh, these are huge priorities for the Air Force. Uh, the design of those, we actually used the Air Force DC-13 contract and capacity there. Uh, and we're in the process of awarding that design contract uh, now just because there was not enough capacity available on the USA side, either in Norfolk District or other districts, to support that. Um, in FY20, we've got seven projects we're looking to award. Two currently in acquisition. Uh, and then we're, we have two that are solicitations are out now, Battalion Complex Phase 2 and 3 in an inch skip edition, and we will soon be getting ready to post uh, solicitations for another barracks complex and DLA DSCR Ops Center. Um, I guess that one note I wanted to make on the MILCON and, and the, the program amounts, uh, just, this is a reminder of everyone, I mean, we cannot exceed $2 million or 25% of the programmed amount on any of our no cons. Otherwise, we've got to go back for congressional reprogramming, which adds generally six to nine months before we can get approval for the additional money and award the contract. So if we put a CCL in the solicitation for our construction folks, it's generally in there for a reason, because the programming amount includes the construction costs, it includes our SNA costs, it includes uh, design during construction. Uh, as well as contingency. So all that stuff adds up to the total program amount. Clearly, it's been a challenge recently because a lot of these were programmed several years ago and the current market uh, is a little bit different than it was then. So just a reminder to all, I mean, that is a huge uh, implication for us. Slide six. Well, it's been too much time on here, but just to recommend how the Norfolk District operates, most everything we do is uh, Competed, very few set asides, and we do have a goal of 10 new contractors each year, and that, that's the reason why we're doing this industry day and continue to try and reach out. Uh, right now, I think we've got three new contractors with four with a recent award last week. So, I mean, we continue to strive for that and appreciate you all participating today. Uh, we don't have a pool of Matox, and then we're, we're going to start, start to put some in place. Uh, to make things easier so we can do task orders. I think we'll hear a little bit more about how we at least do eight task orders later. Uh, and we are using uh, IFBs with DRC a little bit more frequently. So I mean, I've talked about these at numerous industry days the last kind of year and a half uh, and would highlight that we're going to do uh, AIT barrack space for with that strategy. Uh, so it's not just small projects and some of our bigger mill cons as well, if it makes sense from a risk standpoint. And then finally, we've got a whole bunch of source selection boards this summer that, that we've got planned. Someone else, uh, I'm trying to see. Mr. Bynum, so Will, if you could mute your mic, uh, please, that would be helpful. Okay. Uh, the last couple of slides that I'm going to have real quick, I know we've been asked to share who we have uh, existing vehicles with. Uh, so we'll put that list together, at least when they expire. So we just awarded some hydrographic surveys, and then we've got an existing civil survey that uh, we're working to start the initial phases of re-solicitation re for that, along with the value engineering. Uh, the architect Engineer General, I mean, those expire next March, so that's what we're really going to talk about here shortly. That's our current pool, and Dodia pool is on the, on the right. Uh, A&C design has been a, a separate, uh, separate design by HNTB. Uh, good thing all these slides are, one, been shared with you all, and that these are going to be posted in the full program brief is also posted on our website. <laughs> Folks willing to interested in doing work, there's the, the list there. You know, so we've got Dodina SRM, which, and then uh, we've got PMDM, and you can see each of those preventer maintenance uh, contracts are broken down by geographic location. Um, and then just where you can find it on the front of our website, we have the workload forecast. It's updated every couple, at least every other month with uh, new and updated dates. And then the helpful hints, I mean, this is something that we've shared in the past, but again, I would just reinforce 
respond to the market research. I know that's hard with a lot of, I mean, a lot of firms because a lot, a lot of sources saw it out there. But if you're interested, let us know. Uh, stay engaged. You know, this industry day is just the beginning. I mean, if you've got further questions, you want to come in and meet meet with us, and we're willing to do that and, and try and be accommodating under the current conditions. I'm not sure that's going to happen. We'll maybe do some calls, but we'll see what what happens. And then. Most importantly, and we're looking for some feedback today, is to share your best practices and insights. And you know, we're looking to try and get better. And really, we're going to try and gauge a little bit today of what you think are some good evaluation criteria for these contracts to help you compete better and help uh, get help us get the most qualified folks to support us. Um, and I think uh, that's it for me. So I know the next topic is near and dear, and I get a lot of questions about. So. We will turn it over to Ms. Oxley, our Chief of Contracting, to provide some details. We're trying to find the mute button so we can help everybody to hear the presentation. So just one, one moment. Ah. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Katya Axley. I'm Chief of Contracting here. Um, have been with the district uh, about a year and a half, and I'm, I will I'll be talking to you about AE task order procedures, which are a little bit different from the way the Army Corps of Engineers used to conduct business when once the contracts were awarded. So the policy came out in the beginning of March. It's a directive that will lead the way of how we. Uh, place task orders against the multiple award contract. Uh, I want to reiterate that it only applies to the multiple award uh, contract. So uh, Mr. Dara talks to you about the two large May talks that we will be awarding uh, later this year. One is the general IDAQ and also one in support of the AMO program. Um, those May talks will follow these procedures. So I, I you know, I'm we will take some questions, I think, either at the end of the day or um, by submitting them through, um, to Sherry. So we'll, we'll look at your feedback. I'm curious to, to know what you think. But let me tell you um, what we believe is, is how we're going to apply the procedures in order to comply with the directive. So base contracts will be awarded using, um, will be MATOC. If you're awarding more than one, it's going to be MATOC and it will share capacity. So for example, the 200 million multiple award contract that we are working on right now that will be synopsized sometime in April will be announced as um, approximately six MATOC holders with a shared capacity of $200 million. What does it mean to you? It means that if you are the most highly qualified firm for a particular project, you will be able to, in a hypothetical scenario, you can be the only, you can use all of the capacity all to yourself. But um, again, probably not going to happen. But shared capacity allows a lot of flexibility to ensure that the Army Corps of Engineers select the most highly qualified firm to conduct uh, to perform services for each particular project. Another thing to note is that minimum of three firms in each MATOC. Uh, that uh, complies with the Books Act procedures that say that uh, the, the government shall in enter into negotiations with at least three um, most highly qualified firms. Also, the FAR encourages you to update your SF 330s yearly. So we understand that it may be a challenge and a big expense for you. Therefore, the task order procedures, as I will explain today, hopefully will mitigate some of the costs that may be associated with updating your 330s yearly. So once the MATAC is placed and awarded to how many MATAC holders we will, we will deem most highly qualified, we will um, place the task orders against that MATOC by using the task order requirement notice that will be published to all MATOC holders. So whereas previously we were making qualification-based selection among the firms that were awarded contracts, but you may not have been privy to that 
selection, now you will know that, yes, I'm is considering you for a project that we've been tasked to work on. So we will send you notice, my, my shop, my contracting division, contract specialist will send you notice to say, um, this is a project that you'll be considered for, and this is the criteria that you will be evaluated against. So it gives you some transparency of what's going on um, at each election. We, we recognize the effort. Uh, if I may ask somebody to use the mic, that would be great. Thank you. So um, we recognize that it's an effort in time on your, your firm's parts as well. So we will be very um, mindful of that, and our evaluation criteria will, will be short and to the point, there will be project specific, couple of questions, um, not to exceed probably three pages of submission from you all. So um, we will um, ask you, for example, we may ask you, if you've been considered for a chemical plant, we'll ask you for experience with, with something similar to the, to the project that we have in mind. Um, it will include that questionnaire, task order procedure notice, Task order requirement notice will have um, questions, specific questions that you will be asked to answer. It's not um, intended to be long. We'll probably we'll, we will give you reasonable time to respond. You also can potentially let us know that you don't want to be considered for that project. So it will, you will have that flexibility. And. <clears throat> Then selection boards will take a look at the, either the information that we ask you to submit or we can also look at existing 330s on file and make a selection. Another change is that now that you know that you were considered for, um, for selection for that particular project, you certainly can request a debrief and we will accommodate as best as we can given the workload and assignment um, that contract specialist and technical team is working on. So we'll be providing you the feedback of how you, why you were selected or not selected, and we'll, we'll, we'll comply with debriefing um, requirements of, as outlined in FAR Part 15, FAR Part 15. So please submit any questions you may have in, in reference to those procedures, either in today's forum or don't hesitate to send them to me directly or Sherry. I'll be more than happy to answer because I know it's a change from how we used to operate, but we want to make sure it's streamlined not only for us but also for you because you are our partners and we want to make sure that we'll go through the selection process and then negotiation as quickly as possible so we can get to the actual mission of getting the job done. I appreciate your support and I'll turn it over to Ms. Sarah Taylor. Um, so as many of you may recall from the last um, industry day, we had presented several IDIQs that we're, and Norfolk District was planning on putting in place. Um, we're still planning on putting in, them in place. The schedule has uh, shifted slightly, um, and, but today we're going to focus on the general IDIQ and PDJS, the first two on the top of that slide. Next slide. Um, it's, the general evaluation criteria as required by the FAR. Um, I just want to highlight that we are required to review these six items. Um, so you'll see these again throughout the rest of the presentation. So keep those in mind. Um, general AEIDIQ overview and status. Um, current schedule for right now, pre solicitation that we posted um, most likely in early March. Uh, firms selected will be, I'm sorry, April. Uh, firms selected will be uh, notified, should be not in Septem uh, September, and then C test orders will be awarded first quarter for FY21. Capacity is still listed at, uh, expected to be 200 million, and as Katya had noted earlier, it's will not be divided equally among the firms as we're going to may talk as opposed to standalone IDIQs. Um, period of performance will be five years. Uh, set aside will still be unrestricted, which means it will be open to all qualified AEs regardless of size. 
and the scope for this IDIQ will be um, multidiscipline AE services to support Narco District's MILCON, Civil Works, and SRM programs, mainly within the Narco District's AOR, but could be used uh, regionally. AEs will be expected to have experience in planning, programming, feasibility studies, planning surets, master planning, engineering studies, design services, um, drawing and document prep preparation and review, construction management, commissioning, etc. This will be for all of the programs in Norfolk District support. Um, next slide. So one of the questions that we get a lot from because when we talk about this with other AEs is what kind of projects do we like to want to see in the SF 330s? So um, this slide is just to give you guys an example of the projects that Norfolk District produces. So a couple things I wanted to highlight on this slide. Um, estimated construction, as you'll note that we range between $500,000 to $200 million. Um, we have a large variety of projects, including parking garage, um, office building renovations, and new construction, like DLA Office Phase 2. We got barracks projects, um, training facilities at Fort Pickett and AP Hill. We have uh, roadway projects. Uh, road improvement projects, bridge replacements, civil works um, projects like the Craney Island spill box and the Norfolk CSRM. Um, we also have environmental impact studies. We support several different clients and stakeholders, including Arlington National Cemetery, DLA, DLA at Richmond, um, the Army, the Air Force, Radford, and some of our uh, local municipalities as well. Next slide. This is where we get into collection criteria, specifically for the general AEIDIQ. So for this round, we have five um, criteria we'll be looking for for specialized experience. Um, we'll be evaluating you all on your ability to demonstrate um, experience in design of facilities and infrastructures at uh, federal installations, paying particular attention to architecture, utility systems, landscaping, interior design, environmental issues, energy conservation strategies, and sustainability, as well as historic preservation. We'll be looking for examples for in both design bid build as well as design build RFP development and SRM type projects. We will be looking, we will be evaluating you on your ability to demonstrate, um, uh, illustrate considerations on life cycle cost analysis and determine systems to be used as a basis of design. We will be looking for experience and knowledge of high performance sustainable building design and development practices, including certification procedures and energy modeling analysis. We will be looking for um, experience utilizing government, government furnished programs such as Spexum Tech and M2 software. Uh, to, I want to point out that design members that are responsible for generating construction cost estimates must demonstrate M2 software is utilizing M2 software. Um, lastly, we'll be looking for um, experience utilizing the latest cybersecurity UFCs um, when designing building systems. Next slide is professional qualifications. So um, this is the chain from the last uh, IDIQ. We will be uh, requiring your team to encompass everybody on this slide. However, only key personnel will be required to present or provide resumes. I'm not going to read through everybody, but I did want to highlight a few disciplines on this slide. Um, so your landscape architect, you will get higher consideration if you provide, uh, demonstrate cemetery experience. Um, a certified interior designer should have four years of experience with interior design and have a degree in interior design or interior architecture from an accredited university should and have passed the national certification of interior design qualifications. 
Your registered civil engineer, higher consideration will be given to individuals that demonstrate DEQ experience within NAO, Area of Responsibility Watersheds. Your reg uh, registered geotechnical engineer should demonstrate specialized experience in geotechnical analysis and reporting. Uh, your communications engineer should be a registered communications distribution designer accredited by BICSI. Um, fire protection engineer will need to have a minimum of five years experience for fire protection engineering um, and a degree and one of the following, a degree in fire protection engineering from an accredited university or have passed the National Council of Examiners on Engineering and Survey and Fire Protection exam. To be considered a qualified cost estimator, you're looking for um, at least 10 years of cost estimating experience and demonstrating within the resume prior experience generating cost estimates using M2 software. Um, to be considered a certified environmental testing lab, we're looking for the lab to have accreditation from National Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program, DOD Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program, and Virginia Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. To be considered a certified soil boring testing firm, we're looking for somebody that has a national recognized certification, which includes Corps of Engineers, Research and Development Certification. That's it, that's it. Capacity <coughs> firms will be evaluated on their ability to complete multiple, cho multiple projects simultaneously. So, and to show that, we, firms will be asked to provide their current and projected workload within the team. Um, address a plan on how they plan to. Pro I'm sorry. <laughs> address a plan on how they propose to accomplish five additional taskings per year, and provide an organizational chart for the team and discuss management plan for this contract and personnel roles within the organization. We're looking for you to describe the ability for the firm to manage, coordinate, and work effectively with their team members. Task performance. Um, firms will be evaluated in terms of work quality compliance schedules and cost controls with an emphasis on the projects that were submitted as your project examples. We will, um, you will be requested to submit completed CPARS evaluations for each example project. If you do not have a CPARS evaluation, a PPQ may be submitted. We do not need both. Um, in addition to the, those, we will ask that you submit a chart that demonstrates construction cost examples versus actual awards, um, as well as a chart demonstrating actual scheduled performance versus established milestones. For quality uh, control program, firms will be evaluated on the acceptability of their internal quality control program used to ensure technical accuracy and discipline coordination of the plans and specifications. So in order to evaluate that, you will be asked to uh, explain your quality control program, including an example of how the plan has worked for one of your example projects or how the plan is intended to work if it has not been previously used. You will be requested to provide a quality control process chart showing interrelationships of the management and the team components. You will be requested to identify your quality control manager and any key personnel that are responsible responsible for the quality control program. Um, you will be asked to describe specific quality control processes and procedures proposed for this contract specifically for the technical accuracy and assurance of the overall coordination of plans and specifications. Next slide is knowledge of locality. Um, really, we're just looking for firms that must demonstrate familiarity and knowledge of codes, laws, permits, and construction materials and methods within the contact area. We are really looking for more than just your physical address to demonstrate this. Uh, volume of work, 
uh, firms will be evaluated in terms of work previously awarded to the to the firm by the DOD within the past 12 months with the objective of affecting an equitable distribution of contracts among qualified AE firms, including small disadvantaged businesses and firms that have not had prior DOD experience. So small businesses. Firms will be evaluated with their goals for subcontracting with small and disadvantaged businesses in accordance with Norfolk district goals to the extent in which small disadvantaged businesses have been identified for the participation of the overall offerer's team and the offerer's past and present commitment to providing subcontracting opportunities and encouragement. One thing I want to note is that volume of work and small business is considered secondary criteria and will only be used for tiebreaker purposes. And that's all I have. I'll turn it over to Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Booth, the Deputy Chief for Engineering and Construction here at Norfolk District. And the second vehicle we're going to talk about is an IDIQ specifically to support our MO program for PDJS. Um, I'm going to really just annotate the differences that you see highlighted in red from the general IDIQ. So the capacity is similar. Uh, we're still working through the specifics, but slightly larger in that it will probably be between 200 and $250 million. Uh, similarly, with a five-year uh, period and unrestricted and potentially with up to four AEs. Um, the schedule, this one is running approximately three months behind our general. Uh, so whereas you'll see the general pre-solicitation likely come out in early April, uh, this one will probably be in June or July. Uh, this one is going to be specifically for uh, our program at Radford and Holston Army Ammunition Plants, uh, but with the ability to support the other GOCO ammunition plants at Lake City and if needed. <clears throat> so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Colonel Hiley and or John McFassel from PDGF to talk about their program a little bit. And just to orient everybody, we're moving to slide 20. Hey, Tom, Colonel Hiley, I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. Um, hey, first, I do appreciate everyone dying into this. Uh, I know this is uh, obviously different than what we all expected to be, um, being placed on it. Uh, uh, Norfolk and Hampton Roads area, so um, I do appreciate Justin Fire being able to to do this virtually. Um, I do want to reiterate a couple things. You know, Mike Darrow mentioned earlier. So, so first, this is a strategic partnership that's been about two years in the making um, between you know, my my organization, uh, Project Director for Joint Services. So I am I am the Project Director, the PM for, for Joint Services, and um, between us and the Corps of Engineers. And the, the, the reason why we did that, and it was it was a long time coming because my, my charter, my mission, my team's mission is to modernize and maintain the Army's um, government-owned, commercially contract-operated ammunition industrial base. So we have five facilities across the enterprise, um, two of which, you know, we're going to talk about three, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but the, the purpose of, of my team is, the mission of my team is, I said, to modernize and maintain. Most of these facilities were built in World War II. And, and the challenge is we haven't spent a whole lot of money, um, unfortunately, in updating them um, till now. So starting about 2017, we, we started making major investments in the industrial base because we found ourselves um, with, with some pretty dilapidated facilities. Now, we've made significant investments in across the Army uh, in these facilities since 2017. Um, you know, we've almost doubled, the, doubled our budget annually, or more than doubled our budget annually, uh, since 2017, because we are getting key senior leader engagements, um, both at the Army and at the DoD level. And one, one thing to, to mention is these are Army ammunition plants. We support the entire Joint Joint Service Program, uh, hence the name of, of my organization. So we support Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, etc., and they are part of our customer base. And each of these facilities, uh, for the most part, are are single point failures within within the, the DoD. So that is. The, the intent here is to, again, partner with the, with the Corps of Engineers to do some of these modernization projects. Heretofore, we have always uh, partnered almost exclusively with the operating contractor on site. So in the case of Radford Holson, that's BAE. Um, Lake City, that's, that's the North of Brumman. We're trying to get away from that paradigm, um, A, because I can get better pricing, potentially, by having competition, and, and B, each of those operators, we hired them to build product whether it's explosives or small arms or, or whatever, to do a specific function. And 
we did not hire them to do modernization and to grow production capabilities. Uh, so they're trying to separate those two again because now they're they're kind of combined. So so my, my intent is to bring in additional people and then to echo Mike's comments, you know, qualified people, people that have done this type of work um, with chemicals and explosives and stuff and partner with them through the core to, to continue to provide um, the modernization and upgrades that we need to provide cap- capabilities to the warfighter. That, that is the purpose of this partnership. That is the, uh, the reason that I've, I'm working with, you know, Mike Darrow and Colonel Kinsman there at Norfolk, as, as well as, you know, Colonel Hannon in, in Kansas City and other locations uh, t- to bring them on board to you know, strategically partner with them to get to these capabilities to provide, uh, to provide the upgrades that we need you know, across the facilities. So uh, that being said, I'll get into uh, chart 20 here, which is the Radford Army Ammunition Plant. So this is uh, in, in Virginia, uh, southwest Virginia, and, and the, the core capability here is to produce propellants um, and propellant ingredients for, for other facilities. So specifically, nitrocellulose is, a, is the major product that comes out of here. And nitrocellulose drives... Um, all the propellant manufacturers. So propellants that go into that go into artillery shells, that go into small arms, uh, black powder. Uh, that's that's the core capability that that Radford provides. And you see down there in the bottom left quad, um, you see some of those products that, that come out of that come out of Radford. Uh, top right, you see the um, NC facility. That is that is a large four hundred million dollar facility to reduce to replace the World War II legacy facility. Um, and they're scheduled to be on to be completed in uh, in July of 21. Um, we actually the first major product we've done under our strategic partnership with the Corps is a new explosive waste incinerator project um, at Radford. And and again, the operating contractor there, BAE, came with a price and an approach I don't really like, so I gave it to the Corps. And now they're executing that for me, and that is the first you know hundred plus million dollar project we've done. Or will do with with the core um, as part of this this new partnership. So that is that is um, ongoing, and they are working you know, diligently to to provide the capability. Um, have lots of other um, projects coming up. Uh, you see the um, solvent propellant pack out, and a couple other things that are that are going on. Um, I also have major capabilities that are coming uh, that'll be started under this contract potentially um, to include new solvent lines and new solvent less propellant lines coming out of coming out of um, out of out of Radford. So you see that in the bottom bottom right. So those are the some of the major efforts that are going on, um, which essentially could go to the Corps of Engineers as part of the decision making process that I am going through now. Um, now not everything is is chemical specific. Some of our just generic infrastructure projects, as you see water distribution, sanitary sewer, so it's a mix of um, energetic and chemical processes as well as some you know, generic uh, location agnostic facilities, just wastewater, et cetera, um, that they're going on to these facilities. So that's uh, that's Radford. Going on to the next chart, please. Chart 21. Look at Holston. So Radford has propellants. Holston does the explosive. So Holston. Did I have a question? Okay. Holston does explosives for the DOD. And again, customers out of, out of Radford, they're... Um, all over, all over DoD, uh, as well as Holston. Um, more than, or a very large portion of the product I sell out of Holston goes direct to the Air Force. Another large portion goes to the Navy. Um, so again, it's an Army ammunition plant, but we produce capabilities for the entire Joint Warfighting Force. Going to the bottom left, starting there, um, RDX, HMX. Those are the major explosives that come out of Holston, um, and much so both Holston and Radford. These are the largest facilities in the world. No one can produce the level of propellant or the amount of explosives that we do at these two locations. And obviously, we, as the U.S. Army, our U.S. military, we're the biggest consumer of both of those products. Hence, we have the biggest capability. But these are um, these are true national assets with respect to their ability to meet those requirements uh, for our for our military. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Operating contractor here is is uh, Holston as well, uh, so, or BAE, so Holston at, at BAE and Radford. And bottom left, talked about the capabilities, which again, it's primarily explosives and various 
types of explosives have various um, manufacturing requirements associated with them. Top right, uh, we do have some, we are in the process right now of going through a major RDX expansion um, project. That's a billion dollar effort over the course of about four years. And you see some of the projects listed um, that are tied to that major expansion effort. A major plan products, uh, projects, a couple of things down in the bottom right. Um, so again, IM is a sensitive munition. So you know, how do I, how do I um, produce and recover some of the materials that go into those insensitive munitions productions, um, as well as I do have some, some follow-on expansion activities for RDX and IMX. I mentioned some of the idea of generic infrastructure projects ongoing. I did just recently finish up a large wastewater plant uh, there at there at Holston, um, getting ready to execute uh, phase two, which is um, infrastructure, some infrastructure subcomponent upgrades to that uh, same capability. Okay, that is that is Holston, and then lastly, over to Chart 22. This is um, Lake City and Iowa, so two two other facilities, um, two of the major facilities that, that I manage. So uh, Lake City is in Missouri, Iowa is obviously in, in Iowa. So Lake City is essentially small and medium caliber munitions. So if anyone you know buys ammunition uh, from Winchester or um, any of the smaller products, a lot of those actually come out of come out of Lake City. Uh, a significant portion of, of what we produce is actually sold commercially because it helps reduce our overhead rates. Uh, but um, everything from 5.56 mil up to 50 caliber is is uh, produced out of, out of Lake City. And then, so we have a major effort through the core right now going on there, which is a uh, wastewater treatment plant. We uh, discovered you know, through some inspections that that thing was danger close to failing. So we brought in the core of engineers and they're uh, knocking that out of the park for us and doing a great job getting that capability online to continue to produce uh, increased products through there. One of the top efforts coming out of, out of there is going to be the next gen squad weapon. Right now, the Army is in the process of going to a 6.8 millimeter weapon system, and they're doing a down select in about a year and a half. And based on that, that will drive a new ammunition line that we will have to produce um, probably at Lake City. But I'll be, my team will be responsible for standing up that facility, of the design and facilitation of the, of the new ammunition line to support next gen squad weapon. And lastly, going over to Iowa, um, Iowa is, is a LAT facility, load assemble pack. So I will take propellants from Radford, explosives from Holston, and shell bodies uh, for artillery rounds from Scranton, my fifth GOCO, and send them all to Iowa, where I assemble, assemble them all into a finished product. And that is, that is the genesis of what, what Iowa does. So I take products from other locations and I combine them and do final assembly at Iowa. Uh, so that is, you see the list of, of the LAT products there. Um, lots of, lots of um, products are, are produced or get their final form here. So I'll take, again, explosives from, explosives from Holston, and I'll turn them into uh, B4 blocks at Iowa or we'll claim our mines or whatever uh, out at Iowa. So this is kind of the finishing step for a lot of the products, the base products, that are produced out of, out of out of the other facilities. I do have some some products that are coming up here. Um, getting ready ready to design a tank round, a new um, long range artillery lap facility, as well as some some core infrastructure uh, requirements as well. So that is a quick down and dirty of um, of the, the major GOCOs. I do have a fifth GOCO as I mentioned, Scranton, Pennsylvania. They do metal parts there for artillery rounds. Right now, I don't have any major plant activities um, going on out of Scranton that would involve the core. But it, to, to reemphasize a couple things, you know, this this A and E vehicle, my, my intent is to leverage this for the entire enterprise. So I know that that Mike and and Norfolk, you know, they're focused on Radford and Holston, Lake City and Lake City and Iowa are also um, part of the strategic core partnership. And even though they may not be executed you know, directly by Norfolk, they will. Um, or I will leverage this contract vehicle to tap into resources that I need to execute those projects at those locations. I understand there's a lot of information there, um, a lot of data I just threw at everybody, so open, open to having, answering any questions, or uh, I'll hand it back over to, uh, to Tom and company. Over. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. 
So we're on slide 23. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out in terms of the scope of this contract, it's not only the design and planning for these projects, but it's also the possible uh, independent technical review of designs others have done as well. So as Colonel you know, highly mentioned, the GOCO contractor is designing and constructing some of these facilities. So it's possible that we might have some ITR exercises uh, within this IDIQ as well. Um, so this is the IDIQ that we are most interested in your input on. So as Colonel Hiley mentioned, we've got a newly established relationship and we are learning this program and the uh, specific, uh, the uniqueness with it. Um, so with that said, uh, so the differences that we've pointed out here is that we've extended the recency element to 10 years. And we'd be interested in your feedback uh, as to whether this is appropriate. Obviously these facilities are much less um, common and is if 10 years is not appropriate, well, we'd love to hear your suggestions and we'll take those into consideration. Uh, in addition to the recency, we've added uh, specifics for the types of designs and facilities like industrial production handling facilities, explosives and propellant, chemical manufacturing facilities, uh, as well as the supporting facilities and infrastructure that you would typically have in a general IDIQ as well. So we understand that many, many of these aspects are going to come from uh, highly specialized subcontractors, and we fully expect that. So we're going to consider the balancing of the new partnerships versus the experience uh, differently than we have in the past with some of our generals. Uh, in addition to the other uh, experience qualifications, we'll be looking for knowledge of the hazard process uh, hazard analysis methods with um, the DDSB uh, boards, uh, detailed commissioning and training uh, programs for energetics handling and production. Uh, so those are some of the specific experience criteria that we are considering at this time, but again, we welcome your input. And while we are um, welcoming comments and suggestions today, uh, what we'll also do is accept them through the end of the week and we are going to take some time to appropriately address any of those and then we will consolidate uh, and post this recording as well as our Q&A um, responses uh, probably next week sometime. So a clarification has been requested, projects within the last 10 years, is that design or construction complete? <laughs> Sarah, what do we typically do? It's usually 50% through construction. Mm -hmm. So you, we typically say uh, at least 50% through construction. And we understand that you don't often have control of the um, construction award, uh, but there's value to us in considering the, the accuracy of the cost estimate and scheduling uh, aspects of your design. So we take that into consideration, and, and that's why we don't often require construction complete. So at least at this point, that's the way we're leaning. But we welcome feedback if you have suggestions for alternative means to 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 analyze that. We welcome it. So moving on to slide 24. Um, yes, we have one more question. In number of Section S projects required, are there any threshold values, construction value, or design fee? We don't know at this time. All right, so moving on to slide 24 uh, for professional qualifications. Uh, as you can see here in red, uh, I'll talk about the ones that are different from the general. Uh, so the registered environmental engineer, uh, we're going to be looking for the RICRA permitting. That's the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act's hazardous waste permitting program. So that's uh, established by the EPA but run by the state DQs. Um, so we're looking for somebody with experience doing that. A registered chemical engineer, industrial engineer with process, experience doing process optimization, and a health safety engineer. And then the two on the bottom, uh, they're red because they were key personnel under the general, and they are non-key personnel under this one. So while we want them on the team, we're not going to evaluate their resume. So this is another area that we'd like to have your input. If you feel there are qualifications out there that we should be considering, uh, and we had a suggestion prior to the um, um, Prior to the event that we should probably consider environmental and water resources expertise, which we will likely uh, take that suggestion into consideration when refining our criteria as well. So 
So moving on to slide 25 for the additional selection criteria, most of these will be very similar to the general AEIDIQ that Sarah had talked about previously with a focus on the PDGS aspects of it, uh, specifically knowledge of locality for those areas uh, where Radford, Holston, and the other GOCOs are located, uh, and especially with the capacity aspects as the number of AEs and the magnitude of the contract are slightly different, the capacity uh, consideration will be slightly different as well. Okay, with that said, we get to our question and answer session. So we have a couple options for submitting comments, and we have one more. Yes, so this one is not necessarily related to um, what you showed there, but we have a question and an answer to provide to those that are on the phone. Uh, the question was, has there been any discussion on adjustments to FY metrics and expiring one-year funds? And, um, the, and due to the current situation with the, and the answer that Mike Darrow provided on the chat was, we have not had any discussions on adjustments to the FY metrics or expiring um, when your funds at this point in time. Um, the guidance at this time is deliver the program. Okay, great. Sherry, I believe you have a couple questions. Do you wanna rattle the one off for Katya? One of the questions that was submitted, um, we were told from another district as a small business that if you were awarded a small business set-aside SATOC contract and there was a similar unrestricted MATOC contract awarded, that now everyone gets grouped into the same pool for the task order requirements notification and for consideration for each project, and all companies have to compete for the task order. So how does small business that was awarded the state act now compete at that level against a large business? This is a, this is a really interesting question because it, it goes back to how Army Corps of Engineers was doing previously awarding contracts for the same or similar scope and just doing different contracts and not considering. So book sex is very clear. You have to consider um, you have to make a qualification-based selection. It also is clear that um, those contracts that are for um, in support of military construction under one million dollars could be specifically set aside to small business. Anything else is unrestricted. So the question is, the answer to your question specifically is that yes, if it, if, if the district has a project that is over that threshold, then now you are competing. If it's the same scope, um, then you would be competed against unrestricted multiple award, multiple award contract that was the same scope. So we in Norfolk District will make sure that if, if we will either do specific scopes for a specific projects or specific contracts, for example, we're going to do value engineering contracts. So we would consider small business set aside for that particular single award task order. So you will not be competing. If you are the selectee in the idea of the contract, then you will be only one on that state talk and you will not have to compete against anybody else on the task order procedures. So if you are the small business contractor who was selected for multiple award contracts for multidiscipline, the general idea that we talked about today, or if you're a small business contractor that was selected for MO MATOC, then you will be considered among other LODs for selection for any project. So again, yes, you will be competing against others on the qualification-based selection at the task quota level. So one question we had submitted earlier, which I kind of referred to, was um, regarding slides 20 to 22 with the Army ammunition plants overview, uh, there seems to be a sizable amount of environmental water resources requirements that, excuse me, water requirements that will need to be planned and implemented to support these critical projects. Um, therefore, should this require environmental and water services expertise to be more spelled out in the plan draft selection criteria shown on selection slide 23? So that's a, a good suggestion, and we'll take it into consideration when determining the uh, qualifications and experience that we're looking for. 
another question? Yep. Will a draft RFP or scope be released for pre-solicitation, time frame for actual solicitation, RFP release approximately how many days later? So uh, I think if you're referring to the pre-solicitation, do you want to address this? Yes, yes. So um, when, we, when we work on a contract, there's not such thing as a pre-solicitation requirement. So we post an office notice that outlines all the requirements for um, quote, <laughs> quote, the 330 submittal. So the answer, will there be a pre-solicitation notice? No. Um, so once the synopsis was, or sometimes referred to solicitation, which is not a request for proposal, will be posted, then you typically have about 30 days to provide your SS-330 submittal. So that's the reason why we're doing this industry day, to give you a little heads up of what we're going to be looking for in, in uh, once that synopsis is posted, requesting your qualification to be submitted. Okay, uh, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and to final remarks, Colonel Sands. Oh, they said recommend more than 30 day response. So acknowledge full consideration. All righty, so I, I just want to end with. We are absolutely committed to delivering the program um, while keeping everyone safe. So those are the two big things that roll through my, you know, head at this time um, with primary looking at keeping people safe. So that's what we'll do. But, um, you know, talking on delivery of the program, you know, as you know, the, what we're doing today is, is you know, going to be put into place over a period of years. Um, my belief is that coronavirus will be behind us when we are delivering on these contracts. So we got to keep moving forward on um, all the work that we have in delivering the program. We're also very committed to, you know, increased dialogue with contractors and hearing your feedback and incorporating your feedback into the decisions that we make. Um, and it doesn't end with, you know, oh, I didn't get my comment into the WebEx. Feel free to continue to email Sherry Coons with that email address, and uh, we will continue to, you know, receive feedback. Um, and that goes to these AE ones, but also any other solicitations that we have. Um, I do really appreciate you guys calling in, probably from your home or uh, house or wherever you're you're doing it from. Hopefully, not in your pajamas. But uh, thank you so much for dialing in, and that ends uh, the AE Industry Day. Thanks for your time.